Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Over the years, I've built all sorts of fascinating and interesting and iconic air and spacecraft designs in Kerbal Space Program. But there's one hugely popular design which I don't remember actually building, partly because the scale of it was not really compatible with Kerbal's physics engine. That is the humble paper aeroplane. And you might think, well, come on, Scott, it's Kerbal Space Program. Why would you have a paper aeroplane in space? Well, guess what? People have actually flown paper airplane from the edge of space. Sure, they've done it in high altitude balloons. Things like the, the Paris Project, the paper airplane released into space, which was actually partly funded by uh, the Register, the technology news website. They did that back in 2010. But even before that, there was a couple of uh, Japanese scientists who were exploring the idea of deploying a flotilla of paper airplanes from the International Space Station. They were origami masters and one of them was also an aeronautical engineer and he came up with an optimum design for something. He said, look, you know, we could put some markings on it so if they were recovered on the Earth, they could be traced back and we could do some science, which honestly, I'm not sure what kind of science you could do, but it would be really cool to just throw a paper airplane out of the International Space Station. That never happened, unfortunately, but I guess people are still thinking about the idea. And just in the last week, there has been a publication of a paper, also from Japan, study on the dynamics of an origami space plane during Earth atmospheric entry. This is by uh, Koji Su Kojiro Suzuki and Maximilian Berthet. And yeah, they start out with, hey, this is all about space sustainability, but really, it is just about messing around. And what they did was they applied uh, you know, deep physics, numerical modeling tools to the dynamics of an airplane in space. And then they did some serious experimental studies of what happens when a paper airplane comes back to Earth. Now, as you can imagine, a paper airplane is going to have its work cut out heading through the atmosphere, right? Because uh, as we've seen, spacecraft with their heat shields are specially designed to handle the entry you know, into the atmosphere at very high temperatures. Paper, on the other hand, doesn't seem like the kind of thing that might survive it. But on the other hand, a paper airplane, if you take a classical sheet of paper, something that's A4 or letter size, and you fold it, it's about four grams. And the amount of surface area it has means that it has a much lower ballistic coefficient than any spacecraft that we would normally descend through the Earth's atmosphere. That means it decelerates much faster. So that does open the possibility that perhaps something that decelerated quickly enough could experience in, in little enough heating that it actually survives and then can begin to glide its way back to the surface. So now the question is, first, what attitude would re-entry take place in? What, how long, if you toss an airplane out of the uh, space station, and it just experiences the outer atmosphere. How long does it take to get home? Does it you know, assume a stable attitude or does it perhaps you know, spin out of control? So what they did was they took a classic design and they analyzed it. They folded a sheet of paper, they counted out how thick it is. And one of the important things in the design of paper airplanes is that as you fold it near the tip, you're typically gonna fold it over a couple of times. And that means the nose is maybe four sheets of paper thick, as opposed to the tail, which is maybe one sheet thick. And that means the front of the aircraft is narrower and denser, and that helps keep the aircraft stable. That's why, you know, paper airplanes fly. You could have other ones which don't fly particularly well if they don't have enough, you know, uh, mass at this front. So anyway, to figure out how this flies in a vacuum, well, they couldn't actually fly in a vacuum on Earth. So what they did, was they built a computer model. They took their design, they measured it, they figured out where the center of mass was, the mass distribution over the object, they measured the albedo of the surface, and um, then they built a model with a whole bunch of little triangular elements. It's basically a whole bunch of little polygons for this. And their simulation then placed it in a hypothetical high Earth orbit, about 400 kilometers up. Now, of course, at the altitude of the International Space Station, it feels like a vacuum to us, but we are kind of heavy. To a paper airplane, it does actually experience a small amount of drag. At uh, the altitude of the International Space Station, the atmospheric regime is what we call free molecular flow. The 
atoms tend to just bounce off the spacecraft or sort of the object and disappear into deep space. There's no bouncing off other oxygen or air atoms in the vicinity of the object. So you can treat it almost like a collisionless stream of objects bouncing off the surface. So you can build this object and essentially shoot your molecules at it or just figure out the cross section they're offering to the incoming stream. And depending upon the drag on the uh, different point parts of it, you can then simulate the torques. And so you can simulate the rotation, the, the rotational forces that are applied to the object, apply those numerically and figure out the drag. And so using this, they showed that during the early parts of the descent, it does in fact remain stable. It actually turns itself, points towards the airstream or the, the vacuum stream, the very thin, tenuous airstream. Uh, also, in this situation, uh, it's still experiencing enough drag that it deorbits in about four days. Um, but as it gets lower and lower down, the atmosphere gets denser and denser. And it turns out that the increased atmospheric density doesn't appear to interact particularly well with their design. Now, it might be an artifact of their simulation parameters, or it might just be that uh, this thing is naturally not, un not stable when the drag forces start to increase. Because what they found that as it starts to get lower and lower and the density increases, it starts to oscillate up and down and around. You need to get coning motions. And eventually, around a certain altitude, it just starts to spin out of control, which is not great for an aircraft which is supposed to fly in a straight line. But then again, if it's spinning around, that does actually increase the cross section. It does actually increase the drag. So maybe that could actually help get it through the early part of the atmosphere. So around you know 120 to 190 kilometers, the density of the air starts to come up, and you go you sort of go through a sort of transition state, and then you know below about 90 kilometers, you're into like real continuum flow of the the gas, uh, where the molecules are actually bouncing off their, each other quite frequently. And that sort of means that you can start to have uh, actual aerodynamic forces rather than you know ping pong balls bouncing off of the surface. So for the next phase, their computer model just wouldn't work. So they had to come up with a physical model of what a paper airplane would be like, screaming through the atmosphere at many times the speed of sound. So they got a hypersonic wind tunnel a device which is used to research like weapon systems and rockets and all sorts of super high tech stuff and they put a paper airplane in it. Yes, I think they had a Mach 7 wind tunnel and so they built a very small model primarily of the nose of the paper airplane and then they put it on a frame or a sting which would hold it in the stream and the sting was actually shaped like the aft end of the uh, airplane. And once it was mounted correctly, they set up their imaging system so they were going to get like super high frame rate video with like a blade so they can get nice Schlieren imaging of the shock waves that would be generated by this high tech re entry vehicle. I mean, look, think about it. It's a highly sustainable re entry vehicle. It's high tech in that way, right? So, yeah, they put it in the tunnel, opened up the valves, and sure enough, they got shock waves emanating off the nose. They also saw the nose start to bend up and fold back. So the atmospheric conditions were equivalent to being about 40 kilometers up at about Mach 7. But the, so the air density and the dynamic pressure was comparable to that. However, the temperature of the air, the stagnation temperature, was significantly lower than the, what they would experience in real time, real life. So anyway, they uh, obviously they went through this, they looked at the, the aircraft afterwards and they set, saw that, yes, although it only experienced a few seconds of the fury of Mach 3, there was some very obvious blackening or browning of the paper due to the heat that was released. They figured out the air temperature was probably about 600 Celsius and even although it was low density, low pressure, it was enough to cause some charring very on the very surface of the paper. So a paper airplane probably still doesn't survive. <laughs> but it's really cool that they actually put this in a wind tunnel. Now, to be clear, like 
the aircraft may actually handle this a whole lot better. If it's spinning around, it will not be presenting the same side and it will be decelerating more quickly. The real question then is, does a spinning paper airplane, a tumbling airplane, does it come out of this and transition to a stable flight mode and horizontal flight? Well, that will probably depend on the design. Are there materials that are paper-like which would be better? And if you think about it, the polymers that are used to make heat shields are like carbon fiber composites impregnated with a special resin, which uh, releases you know, ablate. So you could probably make like sheets of carbon fiber, fold them into the paper airplane design and then add your resin. And then it would actually be a heat shield in paper airplane form. It might be a little denser, but it doesn't need to be that much denser. It just needs to get through the atmosphere. Uh, you know, this is just a fun little thing. And obviously, I built my own version in Kerbal Space Program. It proved really hard to balance. But it's fun, nevertheless, to mess around in Kerbal Space Program. There are a whole bunch of other people on YouTube who have, like, posted videos of flying paper airplanes in space. And then there's other ideas, like someone testing a boomerang on the space station that was made of paper to see if it would actually fly or if it or to see if it would curve or if it would actually require gravity to make this happen. Yeah, paper airplanes can into space. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. <laughs> <laughs>